Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Taylor and this is my husband Drew and on this channel we talk about life and relationships after leaving the church and do some commentary on uh, evangelicalism and conservative Christianity. I just figured we never introduce ourselves yeah. on this channel so I thought we probably should. <laughs> I'm sorry for my voice. I'm not sure if you guys can tell but it's like kind of gravelly because I'm a little bit under the weather. So I don't think so. You, you don't know, think it's bad? Think okay. okay. So sorry if it does bother anybody. <laughs> Um, today we are back with another collection of evangelical Instagram reels, and I, I think we should just jump into it. What do you think? Yeah, the last time was a trip. I, I guess I'm <laughs> as ready as I'll ever be. Signs you need to anoint and pray over your home. Ongoing sickness, reoccurring nightmares, sexual dreams, an increase in arguments or fighting, extreme fatigue, lack of peace, an unsettling feeling, things getting lost unexpectedly, inability to get sleep. So the implication here is if you're experiencing any of these things in your home, that that must mean or that must be a sign of like spiritual warfare. Yeah, an evil or spirit like or something. like Satan attacking you. Right. And it couldn't possibly be like any sort of natural explanation yeah. for why these things are happening. Like if you're sick, it's because of evil demonic forces. Or if you're having arguments with your partner, it's because of... right demonic or evil forces and it's like if you're sick maybe you're just sick and need to go to the doctor if you're having arguments yeah. with your partner maybe there's just something that you need to address with them yeah. and some underlying reason that that's happening inability to get sleep maybe you're overworked or maybe you're not getting enough exercise or maybe yeah. you're having too much caffeine like there's natural explanations right. for that and i feel like this line of thinking is very dangerous and it's very dangerous to be spreading online because it has the effect of people not actually addressing the root of the problem or yeah. seeking help when they need to because they just think that like praying and reading the bible and anointing their home is going to fix it right and it it probably won't yeah you know? not that alone yeah like i i'm not against people having that ritual like if they're going through tough yeah. times i think having some sort of ritual you do in your house can be beneficial for like your mood and attitude and everything but not if that's a replacement for like actually addressing oh, the yeah, problem for sure of course the first one that sticks out i think to most people sexual dreams yeah yeah um i mean what if what if you know thinking in a christian way here what if you're married and you have sexual dreams about your spouse yeah like is that is that, is that a bad? problem? Yeah. I mean, a lot of these things that she lists are problems that need to be addressed. But the sexual dreams thing, that's not necessarily problematic. That's a very, very natural mm -hmm. thing. It's not necessarily something that you can control. Yeah. And like even you might have sexual dreams about your partner, but sometimes you're going to have sexual dreams about just like random people or strangers or people that you know yeah. in real life. And that's not necessarily something that you can control or it's not really a problem either. Yeah. Like when you're sleeping in your REM cycle, both men and women have a natural cycle of increased arousal yeah. during sleep. And that sometime, sometimes is accompanied with dreams. Yeah. And if you're not having that happen, that actually could be a sign that you have like a health problem. Yeah, potentially. So, I mean, that one I think is just like, that's not even a problem. Yeah, they're being a bit paranoid there. Yeah. So uh, this reel is actually from this Christian influencer called Brittany Dawn. I don't know if you know anything about her. No. Do you, you know the name or, or anything? Should I? Uh, so she was and is a Christian fitness influencer. And she is probably like best known for scamming a bunch of her followers out of money. She created this mm. like personalized fitness program. Um, and people spent like hundreds of dollars on it. And then she actually never delivered on the product and oh. she was sued for it. Oh, yikes. Um, so yeah, she's a scammer. I am hoping that no one in my audience had the unfortunate experience of being scammed by Brittany Dawn. But did you know that at this very moment, data brokers might be selling your personal information to scammers, spammers, or anyone else that may want to target you? This is where the sponsor of today's video, Aura, steps in. Aura is a complete online security service that not only shows you which data brokers are selling your information, but also automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. 
Using Aura, I discovered that 17 data brokers were selling my information. This knowledge definitely made me a little bit uncomfy, but I am relieved to know that Aura has already requested to remove my name from these online databases. This will help me reduce the number of pesky spam emails I receive and also protects me from hackers who could use my information to access things like my social media or bank accounts. If you thought Aura was great already, your signup also includes services services like antivirus, password management, VPN, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more. Actually, as soon as I finished creating my Aura account, I was immediately notified that one of my passwords was compromised in a leak, and I was able to get that quickly resolved using Aura. They really are the complete online security service, and I don't know about you, but I much prefer having all of this in one convenient location rather than having to have multiple apps. If you're interested in checking out Aura, and I highly suggest you do, you can use my link aura.com slash antibot and receive a two week free trial. This link will also be down in the description. Thank you so much, Aura. Now back to the video. Proverbs 4 verse 23, be careful how you think your life is shaped by your thoughts. I know the feeling of depression. You feel like you just can't get through it. Yeah. I can't, I'm crippled, I can't. Yes, you can. We can't do that without the power of Jesus. There is not a friend, not a parent, not a therapist that can heal you, only Jesus can. And this is coming from a girl who had no idea who he was a year ago. If you guys understood what he did for my life and the matter of seven months. You know why? Because I had a surrendered heart. He looks for a surrendered, willing heart that will chase him. Not a depression, not overbearing thoughts, not mental illness, not any of that can keep you down. Because let me tell you, sometimes he's not going to heal you. Sometimes he's not going to take it away, but he will never leave you. He will never abandon you. He didn't take it away. He didn't heal it overnight, but you know what he did? He broke me to build me. And because I was suffering, it made me want to lean on him. It made me need him. It made me hunger for him. And that's why I was so hungry. I still am. I sit here every Tuesday. I'm so hungry. I know that you guys, we're just all fighting something. It's hard and it's difficult, but let's all stay hungry and let's keep fighting for him and let's never stop. Is she okay? <laughs> I'm genuinely concerned for her. Yeah. So, okay. So, there's so much. There's so much here. So first off, this is from a podcast called Girls Gone Bible. It's I, I recently discovered it. And obviously, Girls Gone Bible is a take on Girls Gone Wild, mm -hmm. which was a show started back in the late 90s that's best known for girls, you know, lifting up their tops for the camera. Yeah. And I genuinely am trying to decide whether or not this podcast is a grift or not if these people are genuine or if it's more okay. of a grift because it is hosted by these two actresses. Yeah. They're, that's like their main car career and job is acting. And like, as you see in this little clip, it seems very performative. Mm -hmm. um, like she's kind of starts crying, but there's no tears. It right. seems forced. Yeah. Kind of acted. Um, so I actually want to do an entire deep dive on this podcast because there's just a lot to it. Um, I guess yeah. I, I have to be there for that, don't I? <laughs> Unfortunately. Great. So I think that this is actually a really perfect example of evangelical doublespeak because you notice at the beginning of the clip, she talks about how the only answer uh -huh. and the only way you can be healed from your depression or anxiety or mental illness is through Jesus. Right. But then later in the clip, she says that Jesus won't necessarily heal you. He, and he might, might not even make do it anything worse. for you. So it's like, you can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. Like either he heals you or he doesn't. Yeah. And this is something that we've actually encountered a lot mm -hmm. through our reactions to like Christian influencers and apologists. Yeah. I feel like they're constantly contradicting themselves. Yeah. And I actually think that this is a feature of evangelicalism because it allows them to attribute anything and everything that happens in their life back to god so it's yeah. like if your depression's cured it's because of god if your depression isn't cured it's also because of god but that's good somehow because <laughs> he broke you yeah. which that's kind of he, he was testing you or making you suffer yeah i mean that's a bit 
frightening, I would say. That actually sounds a lot like people who are with an abusive partner like what they say yeah you know yeah definitely oh like uh no it's not that you know my husband is abusive it's actually that you know i really deserve this he's trying to challenge and he's trying to teach me how to be a better wife Mm -hmm. and like no he's abusive yeah it's it's the same thing (laughs) yeah and the thing is there are countless very devoted christians who pray and read their bible and go to church and do all the things that you're supposed post to do yeah and yet still suffer from mental illness yeah just praying and reading your bible isn't a replacement for therapy yeah and these girls kind of are acting like it is right and i feel like if someone who you know said like i'm really trusting in god and I, i'm trying to like you know not lean on my own understanding but really put my faith in god mm-hmm. but i'm still struggling with this mental illness I think these girls would just turn around and be like, well, you're, you haven't truly surrendered to him. Yeah. You didn't do it right. You, yeah, you're, something's wrong with you. You're not doing it right. You haven't surrendered. Even if you say that you have, you're, you're just fooling yourself. Right. And I think that that is just really very, very invalidating for tons of people that are strong Christians, but still, you know, have mental health issues because that's just being human yeah can you imagine if someone was trying to pitch them on um let's say going to therapy and they said nothing will ever fix your problems except for going to this therapist and going to this therapist is going to be the thing that will work better than anything else it will be a cure-all and i've been doing it for seven months and it's only gotten worse and i'm (laughs) so incredibly depressed and I'm hurting and I, I'm completely dependent. I'm hungry for my therapist. I need therapy all day, every day in order to deal with my problem. I'd be like, clearly your therapist is not good. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't helping you. I would expect them to be like, yeah, you shouldn't go to that therapist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is your relationship with God. Like relationship with God, you know, whatever. We're not inherently against that. But this yeah. is <laughs> kind of yeah. scary. How Our Christian Activewear brand can help you become more confident as a Christian in the gym. First, you can be confident in sharing the gospel with someone else at the gym. Someone may even come up to you and ask you about the Proverbs 31, 25 leggings. I'm sure they will. Next, you can be confident that you have the strength of the Lord with you while you work out and he wants you to be super strong and healthy. I, I kind of doubt anyone's going to approach her and ask her about her Proverbs 31 whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think it's really that interesting, to yeah. be honest. What I'm seeing here is they're giving a sales pitch mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. this yeah. product by saying it will help you be like a better Christian yes, somehow. Yes, exactly. That's, yeah. Isn't that like using God's name in vain, kind of? You'd think. <laughs> right? I mean, I think this is an example of how just entangled conservative Christianity is with capitalism. Yeah. Because like the message here is if you buy these leggings, yeah. you'll be a better and more confident Christian. Yeah. So you need to buy them. And it's like, I don't have a problem with people, you know, wearing these leggings and sports bra that have like Christian symbols on them. Like, that's not a problem. Or like even selling that isn't a problem. But there is a problem with saying this, if you buy this product, then you'll be a better Christian. Yeah. I think that that's immoral. Yeah. I wrote in my notes here, I think it sends the message that having the trappings of Christianity is more important than the faith itself. To me, it appears that they're more concerned with cosplaying as a Christian rather than being a Christian. You can be just as confident in your faith without having a matching gym set that has scripture on it. Oh, and also, you know, I don't think that you should be approaching random people in the gym and trying to proselytize (laughs) to them. Oh, yeah. I'm not for that. If somebody is genuinely asking about it, I think that's okay. But just like approaching people out of the blue and being like... Do you want to hear about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I mean, I I don't think that you should do that. Honestly, if someone was approaching me and was saying that stuff, you know, out, that would be one thing. But if I saw them wearing like clothes that was all about that, like a matching gym set that was all about that, I'd be like, this is a much larger red flag than you trying to like share the gospel. You're, you're like a, you're an entrepreneur 
Yeah, for, for God. it's a marketing campaign. Yeah. And like kind of what I said in my last video, like God does not need you to play PR for him. You know, like. <laughs> uh, apparently some people would disagree. Yeah. For atheists, we sure do uh, gatekeep Christianity quite a bit in these responses, I think, huh? <laughs> I don't think it's gatekeeping. I think it's just calling out problematic behavior. Yeah, well, someone's got to do it. <laughs> what do you think about the modesty of this? Because obviously we wouldn't think there's any problem yeah. with dressing that way. But I mean, 10 years ago, would you have no, been okay with no. wearing that? Would other people be okay with you wearing that in the gym? Definitely or anywhere? not. Um, yeah, like and obviously what she's wearing is totally fine don't have a problem with that with it at all but i think that it does show how like subjective and ever evolving and changing uh modesty is in conservative christianity because yeah something like that just a few years ago would have been considered like really immodest yeah. like you're it's hugging your body you're showing a lot of skin but now it's i've kind of noticed that there's this been this change where like gym wear isn't really seen as immodest yeah. among some christians yeah well if there's anything we know about the true faith it's that it never changes true christianity does not change with the culture it's historical yeah it's historical <laughs> christianity buy my gym set please i'm a witch do you know the good news what god did for us i know that he died on the cross for our sins so what did that do for us because like what if i died for you what does that do for you help me out don't look at me i am not christian <laughs> i'm a witch couldn't right. tell you <laughs> so so this is the best news ever this is the good news right so in the old testament they used to have to sacrifice animals because the wages of sin is death but the blood in the body equals life like you can't live without blood in your body right yeah. but jesus lived a life where he never sinned it was the worthy lamb. He took the punishment that we deserved. So by him laying his life down on the cross, his blood was perfect enough to cover our sins, to be that atonement. We have the blood covering us. We are seen perfect in the eyes of God. It's a true form of love. Did you ever hear it explained like that? No. 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 So do you want to rededicate to Christ right now, now that you know the gospel? Okay. You want to pray too? Or no, I'm okay. okay. Say Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. For dying on the cross for me. For dying on the cross for me. For loving me so much. For loving me so much. That you got whipped. So you got whipped. That you got beaten. Beaten. That you got nailed to the cross. That you got nailed to the cross. Just so you can be with me. Just so you can be with me. Just so heaven can be in my heart. Just so heaven can be in my heart. Free me. Free me. From any anxiety. From any anxiety. Any torture at night. Any torture at night. Any fear. Any fear. Let your love live inside of me. Let your love live inside of me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what do you think is like the main thing that's going on in this reel? Like the main focus? It's due to sharing the gospel with random people mm -hmm. for Instagram. And I think like... The main thing that's happening is this girl is rededicating her life. Yeah, they're to, praying and all that. Yeah. You think that that would be like the thing that they focus on because it's like, oh, that's such a, you know, a great thing in their minds mm -hmm. that this girl is rededicating her life to Christ. Yet I find it interesting that the whole time the cameraman is like focusing in on the witch, mm -hmm. even though she's kind of like a side character to this whole Whole interaction yeah. in a way well they need someone like her for this to be in any way interesting because he's yeah. like oh have you heard this before and it's like yeah everyone has heard this before yeah. dude like you you might have put it in slightly different poetic language but like most people have heard this mm -hmm. explained a million times including you know the witch whatever yeah. right so it's not interesting without her right exactly it's not interesting it's a lot more interesting with the witch yeah and there's this phenomenon in, like, Christian YouTube and social media that I've seen and that you've seen. Like, what are, like, the biggest topics that sell in, like, Christian social media? Uh, demons and spiritual yeah. warfare and evil yeah. stuff. Yeah, I would say that, like, for some Christians, they're a lot more – it seems like they're a lot more preoccupied with, like, demons and the devil and darkness and mm -hmm. evil than they are – about god or angels oh, or yeah. heaven because i spend so much more time talking about those topics and those are the things that sell like any 
Christian YouTuber, like, usually their top videos are about, like, demons or exorcism or something. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's because, like, fear sells, for one. But also, for two, I think it's just more interesting. Yeah. Like, I think that people just naturally have an inclination towards the macabre and the dark. And it's just more interesting to people or at least a story that's dynamic has yeah. like tension in it rather than it's not just overwhelmingly positive i mean like look at christian art the amount of christian art and literature about hell versus about mm-hmm. heaven i mean can you give me entire books that were written in the apocrypha that are just about like people going to heaven and, and stories of heaven no there are multiple like that in the apocrypha for about hell and then we also have obviously dante yeah. so yeah, I think that, you know, the bad guys, whatever, evil, torture, mm-hmm. warfare, that's kind of what sells this yeah, stuff in the first place. Yeah, evil and villains are, you know, big sellers yeah. when it comes to stories, for sure. So I, I just thought that was interesting to point out. It's just like they're, they're focusing in on the witch the entire time because it's like, ooh, witch, scary. Yeah. Um, but I also think, like, it's kind of beautiful at the same time because – You know, obviously, this girl that's a witch doesn't agree with Christianity, but yet she's just still allowing her friend to have this experience that is important to her. And she's just standing by, not not participating, but also not discouraging her either. Yeah. And it's sad because you go to all the comments and they're like, oh, like one day this witch will hopefully, you know, hear the gospel or accept Jesus. And it's all like stuff about that. And it's like, I think she was like came off as the best in this entire situation. <laughs> it doesn't seem like her Christian friend really has a problem with her. It's like Yeah, no. Be... It seems like they can co coexist. Yeah. There is a comment on this that I resonate with. They said everything he said sounded just like witchcraft to me. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, um that's because this whole idea of um what what's the technical term the apologists like to use sacrificial intercessory atonement is the technical term uh giving your life for someone in order to pay their debt to something like that yeah that's that's what that means and that essentially comes from jewish blood magic yeah like that's what i was gonna say that yeah like blood magic. It, it comes from blood magic and we know that you know this is not like some like anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, like people were not drinking the blood of children or something like Mm -hmm. that. But there have been many cultures that intermixed with Judaic cultures in Mesopotamia, in the Levant, and they thought that sacrificing animals, you know, making blood run across things had some kind of magical effect Mm -hmm. on such and such. That's it's magic it's, it's yeah, like Christ- it's not that different christianity is still a form of magic it's it's just a form of magic that says this specific type is okay and everything else is horrible and wrong and evil yeah. and bad and there's even forms of christianity that say none of the other forms of magic are real they're all fake they don't actually work mm-hmm. this is the only one that works i would bet that this guy is probably the type that's like oh no bad magic does work that's why we got to proselytized yeah, to witches I would in think malls. So. I don't know for sure, but I would think so. <laughs> bro, you so stupid, bro. Nah, I just... Hey, hold on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I'm good, bro. Nah, 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 you good. Yeah, nah, you stupid, bro. <laughs> it says, how Christian men walk through the mall. Um, I just thought that this one was funny. Yeah, yeah, I like, <laughs> like this one. I like this. And I don't know, like... If you can relate at all. Oh, growing yeah. Growing up. And, oh, yeah. You know, Victoria's Secret was like, ooh, this place that you're like not really supposed to go into, but also you like you really want to go into it. As a former, you know, Christian man, I definitely did kind of avert my eyes there. I don't know if other people can relate, but my youth group did this thing called the mall manhunt where the upperclassmen who like had cars and could drive and all that would go to a local mall dressed up as like a character like in a disguise to try to not be found and then all of the underclassmen would go and try to find them and one of the rules was you can't go into victoria's secret (laughs) you can't go into spencer's you can't go into hot topic and you can't Mm. go into victoria's secret those were the things spencer's kind of makes sense it makes more (laughs) sense if there's gonna be minors Yeah, yeah i get that but 
I do have a contradicting experience to this. Okay. One time when I was, I hope I was no older than 11, or else this would be even more embarrassing. My mom went into Victoria's Secret, and I was at the mall with her. And I was like, I just want to wait Mm -hmm. out here. And uh, she's like, no, you need to stay with me. And so I went into the Victoria's Secret, but I went under a table and like laying in the fetal position under a table in Victoria's Secret. And my mom was in there long enough for me to basically fall asleep under the table. Oh, wow. And I was like waking up and there were women around the table all like shopping off of it. And I'm like, <laughs> oh no, now I can't get out of here without being exposed. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, with the Christian shame there, Victoria's yeah. Secret, it was a traumatizing place, I can say. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do think that women's underwear because victoria's secret doesn't just sell like lingerie they sell you know pajamas bras normal underwear i don't think that that needs to be painted as something that's so like obscene that a man can't just like know that it exists or look at it yeah i'm not really a big fan of that but i think I, th- I don't think that that was necessarily the point of this reel. I yeah. think he was just kind of trying to be funny. Yeah, he's trying to be a little bit hyperbolic just for yeah. a laugh. I thought, it, I thought it was good. He did yeah. a good job overall. The music industry is demonic. Check this out. I swear I wanted to be like the Amy Grant of music. Yeah. <laughs> but it didn't work out, and so I sold myself a little bit of it. Satan was a musician in heaven, and he is directly working in the music industry. So please be careful and watch and listen to him. <laughs> mm. I like how, like, Old Town Road was given it as an example of like Lil Nas X before mm. his you know soul was corrupted by the devil. But in that song, he's literally singing about like cheating on his girlfriend and drinking lean while he's driving a tractor. Yeah, like that's okay. <laughs> but I'm also just like, does this guy not know what a figure of speech is? Yeah. Like just because someone says like, oh, there's lyrics that say. So, sold my soul or Katy Perry talking about like selling her soul mm-hmm. that isn't to be taken literally yeah. like it's a figure of speech yeah and I think that does come from the fact that like blues and rock and roll and pop there has been this precedent of the church accusing like emerging artists in those genres yep. of being satanic or mm-hmm. having some sort of pact with the devil. Which originated, by the way, as a way to demonize blues blues musicians. Because they're who... people of color and slaves. Yeah. 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 And so I think, you know, there is this expression within the music industry, especially for artists that are successful, that they say like, oh, I sold my soul to the devil like it's just an an expression it's yeah. not to be taken literally yeah i don't think that this guy is able to see like past his own nose here he's not no. able to see past his own p- bias what you see a lot of the time is is multifaceted with all this satanic stuff in media right now one people do free advertising if you do something really transgressive and like satanic yeah. occult because you proselytize or polemicize against it, saying, oh, mm-hmm. this is like so bad. And that's kind of free advertising for people to go yeah. check it out. If you create controversy within art, then people yeah. go check it out. Like that's good music has always like historically been transgressive. Yeah. So of course people who are are worried about their bottom line in the in the music industry will want to do something that will get people talking. Yeah. And this stuff will get people talking. But also when it comes to specifically Katy Perry and Lil Nas, what's going on is their comments about selling their soul to the devil or being in league with the devil is a direct response to people accusing them of that for just being, in Lil Nas's case, gay, right. and in Katy Perry's case, going into the secular music industry as a pastor's yeah. daughter. They're just flipping a narrative on its head. They're yeah, saying they're like, 
oh, you're going to accuse me of being satanic for doing something innocent. So sure, I worship the devil, yeah. whatever. They're in a way kind of reclaiming it and mm -hmm. like taking back their power. Yeah. With through doing that. And also Lil Nas X recently had a music video where I think like it had something to do with I don't know if he was portraying himself as Jesus. Mm -hmm. I didn't I haven't actually watched it. But it was basically the opposite of this music video. Yeah. Like it was all about heaven and Jesus and God. Like I think because the LGBT community has been accused of being satanic and demonic, mm -hmm. people are just taking that on and saying, well, oh, you're going to accuse me of that? Well, I guess I'll just be that. Yeah, I'll just I might it. as well, right. since everyone says that I am anyways. Yeah. And it just happens to be, again, going back to like something we were talking about earlier, demonic satan dark themes are like i think inherently more interesting to people yeah. and so it does well right you say you don't believe in god because of the evils the church has done but now this makes no sense if you go to the orchestra and the musicians play beethoven but they butcher his marvelous work whom do you blame beethoven or the people misrepresenting his art does their misunderstanding of the notes on the page discredit Beethoven and his craft? In the same way, how can people's misuse of the scripture somehow point to the blame on the author himself? Does the fact that even churches cause hurt not point to the reason that people go, for they need saving? You decide a religion is not worth following if the god they serve is a failed god, but how can you decide a religion is not worth following by looking at the people who serve him? You say there is no hate like Christian love. It's not that Christians have failed to love you, it's that you failed to believe a God could love you, a person as flawed as the church. If you don't believe God really loves you, how can you love him? If you don't believe that God forgives all things, how can you know how deeply he loves you? How can you forgive his church? If you don't really love him, how can you love others? If you don't love others the way God loves you, how can you point them to God's love? How can they see that God loves you when you are too busy hating his children? The first thing I want to say is, her hair is really, really beautiful. I feel like she used like the water bowl method, but it's neither here nor there. I just wanted to comment that I think she has really pretty hair. I was going to say, this is you in an alternate universe where you didn't sell your soul to the devil. <laughs> she does kind of look a little bit like me, doesn't she? Um, but there is like a lot to unpack yeah. here. And I actually wrote a bunch of notes and I think I just want to read it because yeah. I really want to get this right. So I wrote... First of all, nobody upholds Beethoven's work as the objective standard by which everyone should live their life. Nobody is claiming that you must listen to Beethoven or face eternal torment. So this example isn't really analogous to how people view the Bible. Secondly, the problem is there is no way to separate man's interpretation of the Bible from the Bible itself. There is no objective way to read the Bible because due to the nature of the work, it must be interpreted through the lens of the reader. Therefore, how can we know who is butchering or misrepresenting the Bible and who isn't? Thirdly, since God apparently decided to transmit his perfect word to us through the medium of written word, then he knew beforehand that people would misinterpret it and cause harm to others in the process. God is still accountable for this. I also think that this is a way for Christians as a whole to dodge accountability for the harmful actions of those in their own camp because they can simply say that whoever caused the hurt wasn't really following the Bible and that they weren't actually true Christians. I don't think she meant to do this, but her entire poem just serves to hand wave away any and all accountability the church has for the wrongs it's done. This is why people say that they can't believe in God because of the evils the church has done. Not just because of the evils themselves, but also because of many Christians' absolute refusal to condemn these evils and take accountability for what's gone on in their own camp. A lot of people who give this as a reason they're no longer Christians have experienced religious trauma themselves, and the response of, well, those weren't real Christians isn't helpful. What they've experienced is real, and they deserve at least to have that acknowledged. Yeah, uh, that's, those were my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Yeah, I think that that analogy that she gives at the beginning is pretty bad. And <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just not analogous. I mean, mm -hmm. if you try to compare God and a human artist or author, it kind of breaks down because of course it makes sense that, you know, Beethoven isn't to blame for people playing his thing wrong, mm -hmm. but Beethoven's not omnipotent and omniscient. He would, yeah. he knows that like this is the best that he can do. With a god, he can control everything. He can right. do everything. He can anticipate everything. And so if his work is carried out in his name wrongly, 
then he could have come up with a way for that not to happen. Mm -hmm. There's no way around that. The only way around that is to concede that one of these attributes that God supposedly has is just not true. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe he's not omnipotent. Maybe he's not omniscient. Maybe he's not omnibenevolent. That's just classic problem of evil. And these analogies don't make sense of it. Yeah. I also think that you could argue that music and like notes on a page is a lot less subject to interpretation than Mm. written word like musical notation yeah musical notation is a lot more straightforward i think you can obviously have interpretations of that but i think when it comes to like language things are a lot more yeah just subject to interpretation Mm. and things have changed and morphed throughout time as we have different translations of the bible yeah so also you're right that this reframes things in a very unfair way Mm -hmm. at the end she says you know how could you know such and such if you spent all your time hating his children as if christians are the ones that are really being persecuted and judged and and being treated unfairly when i mean we we know that we we don't have another faith. We don't have another group that's trying to actually completely take over the government mm-hmm. like in the U.S., yeah. right? Like, that's that's a ridiculous straw man. I think that the worst part of this reel is that it is just shifting of the blame. Because I think it's like, you know, you have people, you know, ringing the bell saying like, hey, there's something wrong. Like, these bad things are happening. Yeah. And basically her response is, no, you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> why do you hate Christians? Like, you're the one that's in the wrong. You're yeah. the one that's, you know, doing something bad. When it's like, no, you need to acknowledge that bad things have come from Christianity. That's just a fact. That doesn't yeah. mean that all of Christianity is bad. But you do need to acknowledge that so that you can properly deal with the situation instead of just kind of brushing it under the rug and saying, like, no, they, they're not real Christians. And it's actually, you're just the one that is just like obsessed with hating Christians yeah. or whatever. I have to say a statement from a Christian that I have seen that has made his congregation, I'm talking about a pastor here, that has made his congregation appealing to me more than any anything I've ever seen another apologist or pastor say was to say, it actually makes complete and perfect sense that you would not think that Christianity is a good thing and that you would not want mm to be a part of this. I hope that through hard work, me and my congregation, especially like my congregation, it's not just me, you know, I can't do it by myself, can make a place where you could come and be validated, be understood, be taught, and then be plugged into a community where we can hopefully right some of the wrongs that are being done. Yeah, he's basically saying like, yeah, we have messed up, our yeah. bad, let us try to correct that. Yeah. And like, that's what needs to happen. And I feel like they don't, they don't usually do that. Yeah. And it's kind of like, we wouldn't really necessarily do what we do or critique Christianity in the way that we do if Christians did that themselves. Yeah. You know? By the way, the pastor that I am talking about is a progressive Christian, of course. Uh, yeah. I believe his name is Zach Lambert, and he has... a uh, congregation right here in austin i Hmm. i kind of want to go yeah i think he's pretty cool actually being a christian teenager may be difficult but it's not impossible here are five tips for christian teenagers number one don't fall into hookup culture now i wish i could tell my younger self this because it's so easy for it to just be completely normalized to have everyone hook up with everyone and we should not normalize giving yourself away to someone and many of us in high school are making decisions that will affect us for the rest of our lives so it shouldn't be a casual thing for you to give yourself away to just anybody the man that god has for you is not going to pressure you to do things that you have made a boundary for yourself to not do so wait well for your man of god to commit to you fully instead of giving these guys husband privileges that don't have husband privileges quite yet number two choose to be sober minded it is very easy to fall into partying and drinking in high school and for some of y'all it's 
that's even earlier than that. It can be easy to just fall into peer pressure and want to fit in and you don't want to be the weird one who doesn't go to the parties or, you know, is in the corner and like doesn't have a drink in their hands, right? But let me just tell you, most of the mistakes that I made in high school were when I was severely under the influence. Be sober minded. You will make decisions that are good for the long haul when you are sober minded. Let me just tell you, if you cannot pray to the Lord while you're doing something, you should not be doing that thing. Number three, stay. Okay, so this one's kind of longer and we're not all the way through all of her five things, but I do want you guys to notice how she like puts these things in extremes. It's like either you're, you know, partying and drinking and, you know, getting really drunk or you're completely sober and you don't touch alcohol. Yeah. Or it's you're, you know, hooking up with anyone and everyone and not being careful about sex at all. Or you're, or you're abstinent. Marriage. Yeah. So she's kind of like putting it in these extremes and creating this dichotomy that doesn't really need to be there. Yeah. Because I, I don't think that teenagers or people that are in high school should be, you know, out partying and drinking or just like having a ton of sex. I don't think that that's good. Yeah. But I don't think that the solution to that is to like do the exact opposite. Yeah. Say never, ever, ever do any, any little amount of that. Like that can yeah. almost entice kids to once they have one drink they're like well i had one beer you might, might as well, well like yeah. get drunk or oh i've had sex once okay might as well have unprotected sex with a bunch of different people in really risky <laughs> situations yeah. like yeah i think it's at that age i think it is important for you to have experience with some of these things in a very controlled environment yeah so it's like you need to be talk to by your parents about like safe sex and how to know when you're ready and mm -hmm. how to pick somebody that you're comfortable and that you know you can communicate with yeah and then also like maybe having a beer at home with your parents in a very controlled environment i think it is important for kids to have those experiences so that they can learn how to handle it and how to go about it safely yeah yeah i think that this advice is not horrible exactly it's more just not moderated yeah. particularly well i think it's good that she's saying that it's not good for guys to pressure girls into doing things or anyone to pressure anyone into crossing boundaries yeah. that they have set that's a generally very good thing yeah but of course she has to frame this in a strictly theological way mm -hmm. you know the reason why people shouldn't push your boundaries is because they're God's boundaries and you're yeah. following God, you know, it's, that's why it's bad. I think that we can make an argument for, you know, people shouldn't cross boundaries that you've set from the perspective of that can lead to harm. Right. That can actually yeah. lead to someone bad being outcomes. abused, bad outcomes. I don't think we really need to bring God into it to make that make sense. Right away from gossip now again at the lunch tables it was like the thing to just talk badly about people and to you know hear the tea let me just tell you that is ugly and proverbs 31 girly you know what she does she speaks words of kindness so i want you to be a little bit more like her i want you to practice what ephesians talks about when it says to speak words that edify edification which means encouragement which means uplifting i want you to speak words that are kind that are uplifting that edify the people who hear them so when everyone's gossiping i'm gonna challenge you what if you just say one good thing about that person and then watch it just be literal crickets because you broke that spirit of gossip number four choose to forgive it's easy to get i do want to pause it and kind of just address this whole gossip part of her video because i don't think that gossip is necessarily something that needs to be moralized i think mm -hmm. in a lot of ways gossip can be beneficial i'm actually i'm just gonna read what i wrote here i think gossip is a tool for us to exchange vital information it's a reflection of evolving societal norms and expectations is a way to set standards of conduct for other and facilitate social bonding and there's this philosophy podcast that i was watching that the host said gossip in my view is gaining a sense of someone else's status and trustworthiness an example of this would be like those facebook groups for um women that go on like tinder dates with different guys yeah to like explain the experience that they had whether it was positive or negative so that they can like warn other women about yeah. it 
or like also those groups where it's like oh are you dating this person so that women can see whether or not the guy that they're seeing is also seeing other women yeah i think those are in a way could be considered gossip but i think it's done in this way that's like about harm reduction and about right. um, reducing like negative outcomes so i think it's like obviously gossip can be bad yeah you know it, it can be overboard yeah it can be overboard but not all the time so i i don't think that like gossip itself needs to be portrayed as this thing that's bad in like every circumstance because sometimes it's helpful yeah i also don't really like this mindset of like having to always have something positive or having to pick out the good in somebody in every single situation because like in the example she gave it just might be the case that whoever people are gossiping about, maybe there just really isn't anything positive to say. Or maybe they need to be held accountable. Or maybe, yeah. And yeah. like, you don't need to like find the good. Because I think that that line of thinking can cause people that are in toxic relationships to stay in longer yeah. than they need to because they're constantly just like, oh, well, there's this positive thing about this person when they really just need to accept that this person's not good for them or isn't, yeah. uh, you know, is toxic. Right. Now, if I was hearing you say that as a total outsider to the Christian context of this, I would probably be like, eh, I'm not so sure about that. Hmm. However, I know because I have seen this be applied in certain Christian situations so that when someone is being abusive in a church context, when someone is, you know, not showing the fruits of the spirit, we are supposed to not hold them accountable. We are supposed to like... Just forgive them. <laughs> tame our tongue, forgive them, and mm -hmm. say one nice thing about them because that's what Jesus would do. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, sometimes Jesus literally flipped tables and <laughs> right. freaked out on people. <laughs> and it, it just it is context dependent. Right. You're, you're totally right. Sometimes it's really necessary. And I think that this risks creating a false dichotomy that can be harmful between... All gossip is bad and, right. you know, whatever. Never gossip. Right. <laughs> Hurt out there, okay? Maybe your sibling said things that were really unkind. Maybe it was your ex-best friend. Maybe it was your ex-boyfriend. Maybe it's even older mentor, coach, teacher. You're just struggling to forgive this human being and you harbor bitterness in your heart. But let me just tell you, I love this quote because it says that bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. You are doing yourself more harm than good by having an unforgiveness in your heart by being upset and maybe you do have a right to be angry sometimes when i'm struggling with forgiveness i have to be reminded of how much the lord has forgiven me for and how many times that i have fallen short if i keep holding this sin over this person then god's not going to forgive me for all of my sin choose to live freely and choose to forgive number five choose to be bold for the gospel let me just tell you you are not going to fit in all of the time and guess what you are not supposed to fit in the scriptures say that be strong and courageous the scriptures say go and make disciples you are called to be bold for the gospel so choose to be different and choose to stand out for jesus you know i obviously i don't think proselytizing is good <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that, you know that's talked about that agreed uh, when it comes to the forgiveness stuff, I'm going to push back on what she said, because I don't think that forgiveness is mandatory. Yeah. I think it's totally possible to process your emotions and grieve and, you know, heal without forgiving whoever like wronged you. Yeah. I think for some people, it is something that they feel like they want to do. They either really do forgive that person, or maybe they're just trying to heal and move on and forgiving that person's a way to do that but for other people like especially i'm thinking like victims of essay and yeah. that kind of stuff forgiveness might not be something that they want to do yeah you know it might and not like, make any sense yeah and they don't need to do that to move forward and heal yeah so i i do want to push back on that it occurs to me that maybe she thinks forgiving someone and dealing with something to where someone is not living in your head rent free uh those are synonymous mm. and i don't think that we consider those things synonymous it's no. a very christianese way of saying get that person out of your head move on move past it heal from that you know to put yeah. that in terms of forgiveness 
What do you think about that? No, yeah, I think that that's, yeah, like that's not, that might be the way that she's thinking about it as like those two things are the same, but yeah. like that's, that's not how I would think of it. Yeah. Also the part where she said, like, if you don't forgive others, then how like possibly can Jesus forgive you for your sins? I just think like forgiving somebody because you're afraid of what someone else will do to you yeah. if you don't forgive them is not a great motive, like motivator. Yeah, it's not going to be healing. Yeah, I think that you should forgive somebody if you actually genuinely want to, right. not like under threat. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of what she says. And it also like in her theology, I don't even think that that makes sense because even if you don't choose to forgive someone, as long as you believe that Jesus died for your sins, that's all you need to do to go to heaven. Yeah. So it's like, I forgives you regardless. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He forgives you regardless. Yeah. So like that doesn't even make sense like theologically. Right. The last thing I'll say about this is that. This is Ashley Hetherington. I've covered her before on my channel. And I have noticed that a large portion of her audience are like very young girls. Yeah. Like tweens, teens. Yeah. And I kind of think it's scary that she's putting this like advice out there that's potentially harmful. Yeah. And like kind of promoting herself as this mentor to like young adults. She even refers to herself as like your Christian big sis. And like, I just think that it's like kind of scary and sketchy. Yeah. It would be nice for young people to get advice from someone who is a bit more um, moderated and cares about being educated about something other than one very hyper-specific theological topic. Right. Yeah. Okay. He refuses to leave us while we're filming. So he's just going to be right here for the next one. There was a school teacher who also claimed to be a witch, and what she said is quite disturbing. She said that during her class time, when she would have the kids working on a project, she would sit behind her desk and she would do spells and shoot them like spiritual arrows at the children. But oh, if I you bet. thought that was crazy, <laughs> just wait till you hear what she said next. She said that she could tell which parents <laughs> were praying for their children in the name of Jesus, mm. because as she would shoot these spells towards the kids, it was like they would get burned up in a fire that was all around these children. I want you to know that if you are praying for your children, then your child is covered in the protection of the blood of Jesus. To learn more about prayer and why it's so important, follow or subscribe now. So totally true story, right? Yeah, this just <laughs> seems like Christian conspiracy theorist TikTok. The music, the, the up in your face, like super emotive all the crazy stock footage yeah yeah and like, i tried to like find the origin of this story but i couldn't find anything about it like there's nothing on the internet about a, like that i could find about a school t teacher trying to cast spells on her students i mean i doubt she would know the origin of this it's just uh, yeah. a story for clicks but there was this other reel that I found that has a very similar story. It doesn't involve a school teacher, but like the, the wording's kind of the same. Okay. And the like situation's really similar. So I want to play that one next. Okay. And what was her sister? A, a witch. witch as well. The Wicked Witch of the East, bro. <laughs> Grow up. This ex-high Satanist tells us the importance of prayer. You need to hear this. This is the guy from yeah, last time. you have time. to teach your children to pray. Oh, is it the same guy? I think so. You know, even before sleeping, because uh, I would go to some homes and I cannot access the child because there is a wall of fire around that child. Wow, come on. She just said she would ask to project into these homes. She would try to get access to the children, but she was unable to because the children had prayed and there was a wall of fire around them, a hedge of protection. This is actually biblical. In the book of Job, it says that Satan was unable to do anything to Job because God had a hedge of protection around him and Satan asked the Lord to remove it so he could even do anything. Pray constantly without ceasing and I pray in the name of Jesus that a wall of fire is around you and a hedge of protection in the name of jesus comment hedge of protection god bless you okay yeah i think that that's the same guy is who was same? screaming the prophecy while rocking back oh, and forth tracks. and yeah it's that totally tracks i i'm convinced that this guy is totally serious after seeing especially like the prophecy thing um it 
boggles my mind that people would watch this and take it seriously. It, it's so transparently like it, absurd. It's it's ridiculous and stupid. Yeah. yeah, but isn't it weird how similar this like story is to the like school teacher one? Yeah. And I'm wondering if it just kind of like morphed into being about a school teacher, but really this is the origin of that story. Yeah. This is the same type of short form content. Like they have the yeah. same kind of delivery style. They talk about conspiracy theories. It's, it has emotional music and all that kind of stuff. I I wouldn't be surprised if they were drawing it both from this common source. Yeah, I think so. Although Q, certain Christians in the comments saying, uh, no, this is just something that any believer knows and they're just drawing from their experience. <laughs> I also like that he calls her an ex-high Satanist. And like, as far as I know, like high Satanist isn't a title. Yeah. Either you're a high priestess or a Satanist. And yeah. I, in his like, uh, description he says ex high ranking satanic talks about the importance of prayer mm. so it's like obviously this guy's not super like diligent, diligent or yeah. careful so you know that's not boding well for this story yeah but i did do a little bit of research into the people that were in this clip and from what i understand like this lady and this is her husband over here uh, and he's a pastor of a church in, let me double Kenya. check. Uh, is it Kenya? Yeah. Uh, church in Kenya. And they have like a whole YouTube series where his wife talks about her experience being brought up in witchcraft and how the Lord delivered her from that. And it's kind of like a little sus to me because... You know, they have this whole ministry that's kind of based on that. And they also sell a bunch of books and have a bunch of merch. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like that's a little bit suspect. So these type of stories remind me a lot of like the apocryphal stories that were kind of spread around in the evangelical spaces that we grew up mm -hmm. with. Like yeah. the one in particular I'm thinking of is like the story of Cassie. And this is something we've talked about in my yeah. channel before. But for those of you that don't know, there's uh, this story about during the Columbine shootings, uh, one of the students or like the gunman approached a student and like asked her to um, renounce God, I think. Yeah. Or if she believed in God. Oh, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. If she believed in God. And apparently she said yes and then was shot and killed. Yeah. That's the story. Um but that actually turned out to be fake and that never happened. Yeah. But I, you know, was brought up hearing that this story was very much true. And mm -hmm. I didn't even realize that that was kind of a hoax until I yeah. was like already like not in Christianity right. anymore. And when we talked about this last time on my channel, a lot of people were commenting like, oh, I'm an atheist or I'm, you know... 60 years old and like this is the first time that i'm hearing that that story wasn't true yeah and like it actually like was debunked really really early on after the columbine shootings like happened. within days yeah within days yeah. but the story had already spread so much that people just kind of like accepted it to be true yeah and i think we're seeing kind of the same phenomenon but like maybe amped up with social media because yeah. these type of stories can spread and go viral and not really be fact checked yeah. because i can't you know school teacher casting spells onto students i can't find that story anywhere so yeah. as far as i know it's not true right i've looked at stuff like this in my content before and i've said huh they're not citing any source this story is kind of fantastical and they're not backing it up with anything okay well i'm not gonna believe that one and people are like whoa you didn't debunk it and it's like you have to you have to prove something you have to, to be provide true. Evidence. Yeah, you gotta provide I don't have to debunk something that you haven't provided any evidence for. Like yeah. I don't just believe every single story that pops up on my you know, on my phone. Do you? That's kind of a problem, <laughs> yeah. I would say. A, a story like this that I was brought up with was that rock and roll stemmed from certain musical traditions that existed within tribal societies in either Africa or Haiti, basically where black people are, mm -hmm. and that those people were worshiping and in um, invoking demons mm. in those musical rituals. And now 
some of those people and their sympathizers were purposely infiltrating American culture by bringing rock and roll into, you know, into people's yeah. homes. There is truth that rock music draws on traditions of West African oh, music, yeah. actually. Uh -huh. It's a more feasible explanation, though, that maybe the racism against mm -hmm. black Americans had a little bit more to do with the you guys worship demons thing and this whole conspiracy theory than, you know, demons being real. Right. And the music <laughs> being used to invoke demons. Yeah. But of course, that story spread like crazy because it gave the people who told it lots of social currency and it played on the prejudices of right. the people in their audience. I mean, I'm sure that people who are watching stuff like this have prejudices against religions that are not christianity mm -hmm. they they consider any kind of witchcraft or polytheism or paganism whatever to be high satanic or whatever that means <laughs> yeah and they discriminate against it and think that it's evil and think that it's all about persecuting christians when in reality all of these stories about people persecuting christians like they're made up by christians yeah about things they don't understand yeah, I mean, there is some persecution of Christ of Christians that does happen in certain yeah. countries. And we have evidence for that. We don't yeah. actually need to make things up. I mean, you can see people being jailed or being persecuted, executed, discriminated against in China and in certain Islamic countries. But like, like in that's, the United States? Yeah, that's actually well evidence. Let's go with the evidence cases yeah. rather than these. I think taking this seriously makes a mockery of the Christians who are actually right being targeted totally. i also like how he says at the end like like and comment hedge of protection like he has to get that uh engagement up. yeah so we're at the end of our video for today so what did we learn from this round of reels that i need a drink <laughs> that being a moderately inconvenienced witch is a lot more interesting than rededicating one's life to christ <laughs> yeah that if you're suffering from depression, God can totally cure that, but also he might not cure it. And he might make it way worse. Yeah, <laughs> we don't know. That Satan is obviously after everyone in the music industry as <laughs> evidenced by things that were totally not facetious statements <laughs> at all. And I guess also he, what did that guy say? Like in charge of, or was a musician in heaven or something? Yeah, Satan was a musician in heaven. Is that based on anything in the Bible? Like, I don't think so, right? Is that just where like a made up you, statement? Where do you think Africans got their demon rhythms from? Come on. <laughs> that if you're having sexual dreams, all you need to do is just anoint your door with a, some essential oils, preferably Young Living or else it's not <laughs> the real stuff. How do you anoint your house if you want sexual dreams hmm we need to get some like unbaptism water or something <laughs> unholy water <laughs> thanks so much for watching and a huge thank you to my patrons who help make these videos possible mm -hmm. if you'd like to follow me on social media my instagram mm -hmm. is taylor underscore the underscore antibot if you'd like to support this channel financially a link to my patreon will be down in the description and we'll see you on the next one say bye <laughs>